Welcome everyone to NCFS Unbound um, season two. And this is our first session of 2022. And we're delighted to welcome Mel Melanie Hawthorne. Um, Melanie Hawthorne is professor of French at Texas A&M University. Her work focuses on women writers, uh, primarily of the period uh, 18, from 1850 to 1950 and issues of gender and sexuality. She's currently at work on a biography of René Vivien, um, an ongoing project documenting Vivien's gravesite in Paris can be viewed at melaniehawthorne.com right here. Um, and at this website, you will also find a very um, fascinating um, link to René Vivien's cocktail hour, which I have to say I have already uh, explored uh, with great pleasure. Um, today, she will be discussing her new book, uh, Women's Citizenship and Sexuality, The Transnational Lives of René Vivien, Romain Brooks, and Natalie Barney, uh, published with Liverpool University Press. Um, her inter interlocutrice is Gretchen Schultz. Gretchen teaches French studies at Brown University. Her recent publications include Sapphic Fathers, Discourses of Same-Sex Desire from 19th Century France from 2015, and the co-edited volume with Louis Seyfert, Fairy Tales for the Disillusioned, Enchanted Stories from the French Decadent Tradition from 2016. Her current project addresses the culture of drink in the 19th century. So without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to um, Melanie. There you go. Okay. Um, I'm going to do a screen share because I, I did prepare um, a PowerPoint to kind of uh, by way of an introduction. So um, I will uh, kick off with that um, and um, share with you a copy of the cover of the book, um, which um, by the way, is based on the carte de séjour that I had when I was in France. So that was the source of the, uh, of the illustration. Um, and that's the title, as you can see, it's from Liverpool University Press. Um, the discount code is in the, is in the chat. Unfortunately, it's, an, it's prohibitively expensive because you know these are hardbacks that are printed primarily for libraries. Um, but um, if anyone you know, wins the lottery in the next hour or so, you never know. Um, so the book uh, is uh, uh, started out the sort of inspiration with asking myself a question, which is why all the texts about lesbianism in the 19th century are authored by men. Um, so quick reminder, you know, Balzac, Baudelaire, Zola, Pierre-Louis, the Chanson de Bilitis, um, um, and wondering why women were not um, expressing themselves on this topic in the 19th century. Partly, obviously, women weren't writing so much to begin with, but we do know now, thanks to the work of lots of us in the 19th century French community, that, that, that women were writing. Um, and yet, uh, if they were talking about those kind of experiences, they, those, they didn't make it into the canon. So I was wondering, where are the women in this? And um, what happens when you add women to the paradigm? A lot of times people sort of, you know, say, well, when it comes to sexuality, um, gay, lesbian studies, you know, this was happening. And then women were also doing something similar that was also a little bit different, but more or less the same, you know, add women and stir. Um, and that doesn't kind of work here. Um, and what I noticed was that men were using, um, they were talking about sexuality in, in a variety of ways uh, by using terms that they got from the discourse of nationality. So etymologically speaking, right, the word buggery comes from Bulgarian, you know, in French, bougre. Um, uh, euphemisms for homosexuality were often based in um, based on national terms. So it was the French vice if you were in England or it was the English vice if you were in France or and so on. Uh, when it came to subcultures identifying each other and um, uh, being able to kind of like use codes to identify other people, things like, do you speak German was a pickup line at one time. It is in France, and this is around the time when there was a homosexual scandal in Germany. So that alluding to German um, was a kind of coded way of saying, you know, are you on the same wavelength as me? But um, 
um, that was how you that was how you could sort of identify yourself as a member of a subculture, and then just small details in rereading texts, like in Arbour, um, the young man that the Desessant uh, picks up and debauches is called Langlois, which is to say he's the English boy. Um, uh, so little tiny details like that, when you start to think about why some texts uh, invite a queer reading, sometimes it's some some of these sort of like details, like they invoke a kind of nationalism in a certain way. Um, and I think that's, the, you know, it has to do with these, these, these coded terms. What's behind it, I think, is a kind of typological thinking. Um, you know, Foucault, just a reminder, tells us that the type of the homosexual dates from the 19th century. And um, types, the types here are kind of isomorphic. That is to say, they, they are similar patterns of thought. So one can be superimposed on the other. Um, and just as people were sort of identifying national types, the 19th century is the century of nationalism. There's lots of material out about that. Um, but so just as this discourse of nationalism and types of national nationalities comes into play, I think um, it, it ha it's happening at the same time as the, the, the type of the homosexual, you know, he has a certain kind of case history, he has, a, he, this, the criminologists and sexologists are always trying to identify how can you pick out the criminal, how can you pick out the homosexual, so these, these discourses echo each other, and I think that's why they become switch switch codes uh, for the one for the other. But why aren't women doing it? That's the question, right? I mean, if you assume that this is working uh, effectively for, for men, why aren't women doing it? Um, and in thinking about it and kind of pursuing this, I mean, one of the obvious answers is that in the 19th century, women don't have a nationality. They don't have a nationality of their own. Um, so the legal doctrine of coverture um, the idea that the, either the father or the husband sort of le as a legal entity covers the woman, um, the daughter or the wife. Um, this is one reason why women don't have nationality. Their nationality is always um, attributed through a male relative. You know, daughters have the nationality of their fathers, wives have, na have the nationalities of their husbands. Um, and women are not having some of the experiences that men are having. Um, they're not being conscripted into the military. They certainly don't have, we know that they, for the most part, are not voting. Um, and the other way that we often think about how we know what our nationality is today is through things like passports. Um, and the passport system that we know today really doesn't come into effect until after around the time of World War I and, and then after World War I. So in the 19th century, um, your passport didn't indicate your nationality. So when um, Elizabeth Barrett Browning and Robert Browning elope and they need a passport to travel, they travel on a French passport. They're not, they, they, you know, they don't have to get an English or a British passport. So women are not, women are not having the same experience of nation, nationality as men are having. The methodology, if you want to call it that, that I, that I use for the, for the book is essentially, you know, through biography. Um, and it turns out when I try to write something, it comes out in the form of biography. It seems like that's, that's what I end up doing when I, when I try to do these things. Um, but I think, you know, to some extent, lives are interesting because we all have one. And I'm always interested in how other people get through theirs and, and how, they, how they manage things and how they cope with things and how they respond to things. Um, and I also think of the kind of work that I do, which um, often involves a lot of archival work as a kind of anti-entropy, you know, things break down, um, uh, things tend toward chaos, information gets lost. So anything you can do to stem that uh, breakdown, um, I kind of feel like is doing some kind of good work in the universe. Um, I know it's a tiny corner of the universe, but nevertheless, that's my contribution to kind of holding back. Um, the ruin that awaits all of us at some point in the distant future when the earth crashes into the sun, you know. Um, the women that I work on in this book, um, three women, they're all born in the 1870s, so they are products of the 19th century, they come of age in the 19th century. Um, they're all connected, but they die at different points and that makes a difference. So the first person I talk about is René Vivien, um, and she dies in 1909, so she dies before World War I, and that, that shapes her experience very, it makes her experience very different to that of her, the other two. Um, René Vivien has an affair with Natalie Barney, uh, 
uh, in uh, around 1901. Um, so they are connected. Then after they break up, René Vivien has a very quick affair with Romain Brooks. They don't get along, they don't hit it off. So that, uh, that never becomes much of a thing. But then Romain Brooks and Natalie Barney meet um, after René Vivien dies. And it's actually in fact through René Vivien posthumously that they, that they get together in some ways. And they become um, life companions, lifelong companions, not exclusive companions, um, but because there are other people, uh, other relationships, including important ones. Um, but they are together until the year before Romain Books dies when she breaks up with Natalie Barney. She's in her nineties by then. and. She says, I've had it. Um, so uh, that is a lifelong relationship. And um, Natalie Barney, uh, you can see the portrait there of her that's painted by Romaine Brooks. The image of Romaine Brooks, of course, is that famous self portrait that she does in the 1920s. Um, and Natalie Barney, who of course died 50 years ago to the month. This is the, this is the 50th anniversary of her death. So Brooks and Barney both die in the 1970s. And so they, they have quite a long uh, life after uh, René Vivien dies. And that, that, that sort of makes a difference in fact. So um, and there's a chapter on each one of them. And um, in each case, I try to sort of add something to the biographical record based on things that I found. So uh, we know that René Vivien traveled a lot in Europe, but we didn't always know that she, she did in fact travel to Asia. Um, she was an important collector of Asian works, but the travel took place after she collected. It was very late in her life. Um, but nevertheless, I can document the fact that she, um, she went to Japan, China, uh, Hawaii, uh, et cetera. Um, still without a passport though, she never had a passport. That's what's interesting about her travel. Um, I also found the records of Romaine Brooks' illegitimate child. The, the biographer said, you know, she's, she reportedly had an illegitimate child. Well, she did. Um, and the, the book contains the story of that child and, and what happened to the child. And then a very bizarre obituary of Natalie Barney that appeared in the New York Times after she died, um, in which they absolutely insist on the fact that she was married and not just once, but twice, like she was married twice, according to the New York Times. Um, and even more bizarrely to her father, like they get her so wrong um, and it's so sort of Oedipal and it's so interesting that they make this, this mistake. So um, those are some of the sort of sources of material that I, that I use. Um, but I'm, also, I'm interested in their national belonging. I'm interested in the fact, for example, that, 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 that René Vivian probably never had a passport. All the travel she did, she would never have had the experience that so many of us have today, where you cross a national border and somebody makes you produce a, a piece of evidence about what your nationality is. Um, that would have been a, an entirely foreign experience to her. Um, Brooks, on the other hand, was expatriated because in 1907, the United States passed the Expatriation Act that said if you married a man who wasn't American, you lost your American citizenship. And of course, she was married to a Brit. Um, so that was a very, um, you know, experience that would bring you up very short. And Barney, who lived all her life in France, but never became a French citizen. So those are some of the ways in which um, I look at how they were all transnational. Um, Brooks and uh, Barney were American, um, sort of, um, by, I mean, by birth. Um, and uh, René Vivien, her mother was American, but of course her mother lost her citizenship and um, her father was English. Um, so none of them were born in France. None of them were sort of French by uh, conventional definition of that term. And yet they all lived in France, worked in France, died in France and so on. Um, and it's kind of a Goldilocks story in some ways because um, partly what I'm arguing is that for René Vivien, nationality was, was, was a very loose category precisely because she didn't have these kinds of experiences. Um, and consequently, I think her, her, defini her sexual definitions were also very loose. Um, she's well known for having um, resurrected the work of Sappho. She, was, she learned Greek so that she could translate Sappho. She imitates Sappho's um, verse forms and so on. But, but it seems really more like for her, Seth, the fact that Sappho was a lesbian is more of a geographical term. Like a lesbian is somebody who lives in Lesbos, um, which by the way is Turkish at this time. It's not even Greek, um, it's part of Turkey. Um, so her, her sense of, I think, sexuality was very loose as a result of that. 
Brooks is the other end of the scale. You know, she's expatriated. She has a child. She's the mother of a French citizen, but she refuses to be that. But these are experiences that define her from the outside. So for her, I think sort of a sex, sexual categories were way too constricting and confining. Um, and, you know, for Natalie Barney, maybe it's just right. Uh, she lives her whole life in France, but she never becomes a citizen. She remains a denizen, which is to say an inhabitant, but one without the sort of civil rights of a, of a citizen. So that, that balance comes at a, arguably at a, at a cost. Um, uh, that's the end, uh, the, the very end of the story. I talk a little bit about my own experience of becoming an American citizen and some of the quirky things that are still happening in terms of asymmetries between um, men and women um, today. And um, I talk about uh, my own experience of becoming a citizen, which became an exercise in having to perform gender um, because the summons to appear in court for the final, for the final um, act of becoming a citizen, the summons that I received had a very interesting message stamped on it. And it said, men must wear ties and women must wear dresses. So it's like, in order to get your citizenship, you have to you have to perform gender, which, so this was, you know, 1999. So I think it's very interesting how these ideas are still tied together, but th that's the gist. So um, <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that was that, that, you know, I think there's still, there's still a lot to be said about the ways in which these things inter interact. Um, I started off, I started, I start the book by talking about an episode from the Ellen show when Ellen DeGeneres came out in the 1990s. Some of you may remember her show. And she had Emma Thompson as a guest on one of the episodes um, after she came out. And Emma Thompson in turn came out, but not as a lesbian. She came out as not really British. She said, I was born in Dayton, Ohio, which is where Natalie Barney was born. So, um, you know, it's interesting how some of these things come back around. Voila. Um, and thanks, Melanie, for inviting me to to grill you um oh, yeah. well, mine. always a pleasure um i i guess i could start by saying that um there's there's quite a lot about about your writing that i admire and um so this is an opportunity for me to uh, faire ton éloge a little bit um too kind it's uh, it's quite a good read it's quite in, engaging um Somehow Melanie is able to be uh, rigorous, lucid, multi-layered, um, but at the same time, really funny and a fun read. Um, she's a good storyteller, as I think you can already already see here. And um, when when I read this book, I sort of felt a bit like I was going on a ride with someone else in the driver's seat and I wasn't quite sure where I was gonna end up, but um, there were all sorts of really fascinating things to discover along the way. And in part that's, that's due to her archival work, which she's mentioned, and also just the, the wide rangings of um, what Melanie calls upon when, when she's telling her story. Um, I mean, you could summarize this book as a study of the ways in which marginal sexual identities have been expressed through the trope of national identity, focusing in particular on the, work, the works of um, these three expat uh, belle époque lesbians, um, and more generally, um, Queers of the Epoch because she talks about Oscar Wilde as, as, as well. So it's that, but really it is so much more. She, she talks about the histories of passports and marriage laws, uh, dual citizenship and statelessness, late 20th century media culture, their forays into British and American literature. And as she mentioned, um, Melanie tells her own experience of becoming a naturalized US citizen. Um, so I guess I, I just have to start here. I know the answer to this question now, but um, when you read the book, uh, Melanie relates the story about how men have to wear suits and ties and women have to wear dresses. And that when she shows up, actually there are some women um, 
who are wearing trousers, but she never says what mm -hmm. she's wearing. So my question to her is, did you wear a dress? Yeah, I wore I wore I wore the interview suit that I interviewed in for my job at the MLA, which was, you know, a, a, a heavy. So this is in San Antonio in March, which is pretty warm. And I'm wearing, you know, a wool, a formal wool business suit, business attire. Yeah. That, and that's the last time I wore it. Uh, but the one thing you one thing I learned about, you know, immigration is you, it's a law unto itself. It's it, it was even then. It's even more so now. It became even more of a law unto itself after 2001. But my experience was prior to that. Thank goodness. Um, <laughs> Richard says, yeah, he remembers that suit. I know. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't have it anymore. <laughs> no. Yeah, um, you know, one of the things about getting tenure is I decided I really didn't need it anymore. But um, <laughs> but uh, you don't mess with you don't mess with immigration. I mean, it was a very enlightening experience in many many ways because you know you encounter authority in its purest form. It's something like Ancien Régime France. It's you know, it, it's entirely um, accountable only to itself. Um, which was very instructive in many ways. But as I say, the, the relevant thing for the book was the way in which I realized this was such a, um, it, 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 it's, it's one of the ways in which you are interpolated and gendered by the state and by powers. And, you know, the people, nobody showed up at that, nobody showed up at those hearings in blue jeans or, you know, nobody flouted that uh, directive um, completely. Everybody, you know, the point was it was formal dress. They didn't say formal dress. They said, they said when men must wear ties, they didn't say men had to wear pants, but they all did. Um, but, um, you know, nobody, nobody flouted that law. Everybody who was, uh, who was applying for citizenship uh, observed the formality of the occasion, which I think is also revealing. There was, you know, several hundred people, but there you go. Okay. Yes. Yes. Uh I, you know, I obeyed. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes you have to. We do. <laughs> we do. Awful. Yeah. Um, so coming back to your archival work, um, Melanie, the the driver, has a Sherlock Holmes hat on, and she's looking through um, a magnifying glass. Okay. Yep. Um, I I do want to ask you something about Romaine Brooks, um, mm -hmm. ask you to elaborate on, on that chapter because I think that's really where um, some of the most compelling uh, original research happens. Yeah. Um, so let me first just read from the introduction. Um, this, is, this is how, how Melanie describes her project. I'm interested in exploring how transnational identifications may be claimed or, cho or chosen versus how they are imposed by external circumstances. As I believe that there has been an emphasis on the liberating possibilities of the former at the expense of recognizing the constraints of the latter. So the constraints of having transnational identifications in imposed through external circumstances. Um, can you talk more then about the imposition of transnational identities uh, as it functions as constraint in the case of Romaine Brooks? Yeah, yeah, she's such an interesting character um, because she has all these experiences. So number one, she's not born in the United States. She's supposed to be born in Rome, which is where she gets her birth name Romaine. Um, though she was in, initially known by the name Beatrice, and I even found a rec one record that refers to it by the name Clara. So, um, but but remains the one she, and I couldn't find, you, I cannot find a birth certificate for her. So um, I had somebody look in Rome for me and, uh, you know, somebody with a little bit of authority and clout and could not find a birth certificate. Um, she grows up in Philadelphia. Um, she has a, her family is weird. Her, her her father seems to drop out of the picture pretty quickly, and her mother is taking care of her brother. Who her, her brother seems to be. We we might to, to today he might be described as maybe schizophrenic. I don't know what the diagnosis would be, but he's he has some serious mental issues, um, and so the whole family is a little dysfunctional. And at some point they move to uh, they're, they're wealthy. They move to a villa in the south of France that's right on the Italian border. 
And her mother, Ella, has this chateau decorated. And the decor says, all, says everything says Ella's world. And interestingly enough, the villa is positioned right on the French-Italian border. So literally the, the um, border station is right, at, is, is right at the end of their driveway, right outside. So every time you leave the house, you're crossing a border. And this in combination with Ella's world makes it seem as though she's growing up in an entirely different world to everybody else, a, a completely sort of unique uh, country of, of, of their own. Um, and she she grows up. She's she's educated uh, around the world. She's she goes to a school in 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 the United States. She goes to a school in Italy. Um, she 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 is not she she moves around the world very fluidly uh, for the first couple of decades of her life. But then she has this experience in the 1890s where she gives birth to an illegitimate child. And um, the French are great record keepers. And it turns out there's a whole dossier on this child, which is in the Archive de Paris that I was able to find and access and tells the story um, of what happened. So the records say that, you know, she gives birth to the child. The, the child's name is Jeanne Louise. It's a girl. Um, but the record says, like, the mother refuses to take her. So the child is left in the care of the state. And, uh, you know, it's like she just refuses. She she will not be a mother. She we don't know if this is because the child is the result of, of rape, which is one theory that um, is, has been put out. Um, but for for whatever reason, she just refuses. Uh, she Romaine Brooks refuses this role. And the child, uh, you know, lives for a while and then dies in state custody. Um, a few years later. Romaine Goddard, as she was then, her unmarried name, marries John Ellingham Brooks, a Brit, um, a sort of a good for nothing Brit. And they write to the archives and they want to come and reclaim the child. It's like they're going to make a nuclear family or something now. Um, and they write to the archives and uh, say, you know, we, we'd like to come and collect this child now and please, you know, please tell us what's happened. And the archives have to write back and say, well, we're really sorry to inform you, but the child, the child is dead. You know, the child didn't, did, you know, is no longer with us. So, you know, that's a whole sort of like, you, you know, you can read all kinds of sort of second thoughts into that. Um, meantime, as, she, as I just said, she marries a Brit. Um, she marries him in, I forget now, but before this act is passed. And then a couple of years later, the United States, um, uh, you know, um, alienate alienates her by passing this 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 act that makes um women who, only women not men of course doesn't apply the other it's totally gender asymmetrical um makes her forces her to become a british citizen um this is the identity she chooses to keep because her birth name is beatrice goddard but the name she's known by for the rest of her life is is romaine brooks brooks is you know her erstwhile british husband's name um, they separate fairly quickly after the marriage, but I have I was not able to find any record that they actually divorced. Divorce would have been theoretically possible, um, but divorce is really hard to prove because you could you know you could divorce anywhere in the world. They could have divorced on Capri. They could. The records I looked for, at for were in London, which is where she was living at the time. Um, but it, they could have divorced in Acapulco. Um, you know, it, it, it's much harder to find divorce records. Um, but so it seems as though she remained married until he died in 1928. And then she tries to reclaim her American citizenship, which is a, which by then was an option. Um, but she claims to have been born in Philadelphia at that point. Uh, you know, she, she essentially lies, um, assuming, assuming it's true that she was born in, in Rome, which is what the biographies say. Um, but so, uh, you know, and she's claimed today as an American painter, like the Smithsonian, where a lot of her um, archives are, you know, categorizes her as an American, you know, now she has been reclaimed, you know, now that she's famous, she is reclaimed as American. Um, but America was all too willing to repudiate her at one point. Um, and I think you see this a little bit in her painting. Um, you know, her paintings have been described as cambrioleur dame, which it gets it gets um, it gets mistranslated and it gets uh, misapplied because people people translate it as a thief of souls and it's not a thief it's a burglar which is a different kind of theft burglary involves you know um, invading your private space it's not just it's not just a theft that takes place in the street it's an invasion of your privacy 
cambriolage. It's breaking into your home. And it's not she who's the cambrioleur, it's the portraits. So I think, I think the way that that um, explores, um, you know, violating boundaries, the way that she's using her art to explore violating personal boundaries, I think ties in very well with the way in which her own boundaries have been violated by institutions that um, keep trying to place her in a certain box. And despite the fact that she's wealthy and she can travel and she can live where she likes and she has all kinds of privilege by virtue of being wealthy and white and, uh, and so on, um, I think she experienced um, some, some interesting um, imposed identities in her own life. So in contrast with Brooks, um, Barney appears not to have suffered from such impositions. Can you say why? Yeah, I mean, I, 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 Barney, I think, um, you know, partly uh, she didn't get married. Uh, so she didn't have, you know, she didn't have this issue of, of losing her American citizenship. She kept her American citizenship all her life. The hardest time for Barney was World War II because she spent it in Florence. Um, and she was under the protection of sort of some, you know, some of the sort of fascists uh, with, with actually with Brooks. Um, but she was under the protection of sort of some local fascists. So when she wanted to go back to France after World War II, she had a little bit of a hard time, but she was wealthy. Um, and I think that that insulated her against a lot of things. So she sort of found the sweet spot. She's found the sweet spot in between uh, René Vivien, who traveled hugely, but never really, never, never really had to define herself in, in terms of um, uh, categories very much. Um, Barney did a little bit, um, but she, but she, she evaded, she evaded being. I mean, it's not interestingly enough. I say she didn't get married. She did get married. Uh, well, not legally. Um, but um, in 1918, she signed a marriage contract with Lily de Gramont, who was her other long-term partner. Um, and it, it has no legal import whatsoever because Lily, for one thing, Lily de Gramont was already married um, to somebody else. So it would have been a bigamous, it would have been a bigamous marriage. Um, and, but of course, you know, two women couldn't get married then anyway. Um, but, but, but so I think it, but it illustrates the way that she um, plays the edges, right? So it's marriage, but it isn't marriage. It's not a marriage that has legal consequences. It's not a marriage that gets her alienated. It's totally a marriage that they, they agree on and they, they decide the terms and, and, and what that's going to mean, but it doesn't have any kind of legal constraints attached to it. So I think she, she's, she's very, and she, you know, she, she was a very happy lesbian. She, you know, def, she wrote about defending lesbianism um, it, it, uh, you know, she 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 never sort of was was um, got into trouble with the police or uh, despite some of her adventures. Um, but she seems to have found a way to sort of uh, uh, negotiate these identities where the, where they where they had minimal effect on her, but she could use she could use her uh, her, her privileges. So they were all stinking rich, right? And yes, I know. Wouldn't it be nice? Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I don't want to underplay the extent to which their, their, their wealth gave them privileges that most other people didn't have. I mean, I think that's an important element to the story. Can you, can you talk a, a bit about the French specificity uh, with regard to citizenship in the 19th century in light of the code, um, yeah. in light of uh, sort of Republican um, yeah. Republicanism and its tenets. Yeah. Well, you know, it, it, citizenship is a, is, a, is a funny concept, and I had to wrestle with that a lot in the book, because citizenship means a lot of different, slightly different things, even though we all think we know what it means. Um, so there's a discourse of citizenship, which is about what makes a good citizen. Right, you know, a good citizen who you know is educated about politics and, and participates in a democracy and votes and blah, 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 blah. Um, but then there's another kind of citizenship, which is like, you know, the citizens that a country, a, a state is stuck with by virtue of the fact that they're born there. And you could be the worst citizen in the world, but if you if you are born in France, you are a French citizen or and, and some other, I mean, I'm not gonna get into the weeds about 
defining who is and isn't French and if you're not if you're not born in France and so on. But but just to sort of stick with the sort of the obvious the obvious outlines at the moment. Um, but what that gets you is is different if you're a man or a woman, right? So you know, despite all the um, ideology in the in the 18th century about you know citizenship and the revolution and everybody's a citoyen, and everything. Women are citoyen, but they're but they're not when it comes to legal being a legal entity. And certainly by the time of the formulation of the Code Napoleon, they are minors for life. I mean, they they they. You know, they you might be a you might be a French citizen in one box in the sense that you are the mother of a French citizen and you are raising future French citizens and things are expected of you, but you're not a citizen when it comes to having legal rights, having having a vote, uh, and in, of course the vote's very late in France. You know, 1944. Um, so uh, you know, one has to distinguish between different levels of citizenship when when you when you talk about citizenship. What which of those discourses are you invoking? Um, and um, as to the universalism, again, um, France sort of says, you know, a lot of things are your own business, it's your private life. And, 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 in, and for the most part, that, that is reflected in legal things, but of, course, but of course, it's not reflected in social things. So there are all kinds of distinctions that people are making. And as I said, I mean, I think a good, a good example of that is the sort of sexology and criminology at the end of the 19th century in France, where um, you know, people are trying to decide, you know, can, how can we can we identify criminals? Is, is there a criminal type? You know, can we measure people's thumbs? Is it, you know, a thumb that bends this way or um, and there, and of course, you know, the, the homosexual is a sort of like overlaps with the criminal. Um, um, and the male homosexual mostly is what they're talking about because the female homosexual is, is more uh, lumped in with prostitution, courtesanship. Um, uh, sort of pornographic discourses in the pleasures of men, um, but 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 the, but the the discourse of of universalism doesn't preclude um, people trying to make distinctions about other other types of person within French society. So it's it's a difficult thing to pin down but i think these things exist sort of in parallel with each other and sometimes in contradiction uh you know universalism is all very well but it it only goes so far um it, it you know the the state and society society is not always quite the same thing as the state but uh society is still interested in types of people we're, we're interested in types of people so we can predict people's behavior so we we can decide who to who you know who to react to and how we want to behave with people so those things still come into play i think a lot um, maybe one more question um i mean i have many more but time is passing um and it's it's i guess it's a meta question i'd like to talk with you about writing um about why and how you wrote this book you and i have had conversations in the past about our ambivalence toward academic writing the codes that are imposed the politics of citation the obligation to be to perform mastery and and, and so on um, there besides it's just sometimes ugly prose, right? So what do you yeah, do yeah. with that? Uh, there are ways that you push back against it in, in this book. And if I can give just one um, example, um, to just look typographically at the, um, <clears throat> at the afterward and timeline, if you can see this, where there are two things going on at once. Here, Melanie tells her story of naturalization and here we have a list of historical events um, in an international framework, uh, events having to do with citizen, citizenship laws and, and so on. Um, so can you talk a little bit about other ways in which you contend with the, the strictures and limitations of academic prose in your writing? Yeah. Well, uh, I think, uh, you know, you and I, have, as you said, we, we've talked about this and, and I, you and I was sort of also in graduate school at a similar moment where, you know, things were very theoretical and, uh, you know, a lot of work was done simply sitting in front of a text and, and, and sort of interrogating a text and thinking about that. And so, 
um, doing archival research when I started doing it was extremely intimidating. It wasn't something that we were formed to do in grad school at all. I, 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 I'm guessing your experience is similar to mine, even though you were, you know, you were at Cornell. But um, hey, I just have to interrupt and say, remember when we first met? I was an undergrad and you were a grad student. Yes, I know, Michigan. <laughs> yeah, I know. Um, but I mean, you know, it was a it was a moment of theory. We weren't trained. We weren't trained to do uh, archival research or anything. So, so. Um, as I said, talking, you know, coming to do, coming, to, what I found out was when I started trying to write things, what I was writing was biography. And, and at some point I just sort of like accepted that this is, the, you know, this is what, this is what you do. You find out what you do by writing, right? Uh, you, you know, the notion, the notion that you sort of plan something and then you sit down and you write it and it comes out the way you planned it in your head to me is completely alien. That And, and that never worked for me. And it, and it was inhibiting when I tried to do it. So at some point, um, are you telling me someone else is driving the bus? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Some someone else, and it's not me. So I just put my faith in that whatever that is that's that's driving the bus. Uh, but it isn't. Yeah, it isn't me. Um, but it's what comes out. And as I said, in, in in thinking about it, I think it's because I I find it fascinating how these people that I mean I'm interested in how they produce the texts, um, and I'm interested in the texts themselves. But I just kind of want to know, like, where on earth did this come from? Who did? And it's, you know, it started out working on Hachil because um, Patsy Baudouin, who I think is here somewhere in the, gave me a copy of Monsieur Venus. Patsy was working at Schoenhoff's and the book was, was um, reprinted, sent me a copy of this book and I read it and I'm like, who is this person? And uh, uh, when I started reading about her, um, I read things and it was like, well, how do we know that? Like, how on earth do we know? that this is, you know, who said that? And and it seems so obviously that they said that because they had a certain person they were trying to impress or they were trying to be scandalous or they were trying, you know, they had an effect that they were going for. Does that affect whether it's true or not? And so from thinking I would write a, an article about Monsieur Venus, I ended up writing a whole book about Rachel because when I started sort of picking apart the various stories that people told, um, come to find out, you know, not everything was fiable, not everything was reliable. So you had to sort of like do it all yourself again. Um, and, and that's kind of the process a little bit. I mean, I'm doing more of that now in the book on, on, on René Vivien. Um, but, um, you know, trying to pick apart the stories that everybody thinks they know and uh, understand where, how those stories get constructed. So you end up, you know, I end up doing biography, but it ends up also telling a story and it's not the kind of theoretical, um, philosophical, like I'm happier if I can make that practical. I'm happier if I can make that um, 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 if, if, if the reflection comes out of a concrete uh, story or anecdote. Um, um, I mean, I, I will I will just tell one anecdote because it's one of the favorite stories that I came across when I was doing this was uh, an account by a minor British aristocrat who was right who was writing in retrospect. This is memoirs, so she's writing in retrospect. But she's writing about a time when uh, this is in the first decade of the of the ninety of the nineteen hundreds. So during the period of, of René Vivien, and she describes being at a hunting party dinner, um, at, you know, minor aristocracy in Britain, and um, uh, uh, the the daughter of the family asks her at dinner, says, are you a lesbian? Uh, I am. And the, this woman replies, no, I'm Scottish and Irish, you know, and I mean, you know, you can't imagine somebody asking that question and making that misprision today. And yet at the time, um, you know, so it's an anecdote and it's humorous and I think, it, but I think it also, it says a lot, both about how, when I say, you know, I think lesbianism is a geographical term at this point, that's, that's a great illustration of, the, of, of what I mean. But I also think it's fascinating how, um, this is a question that between two married women, like what on earth does it mean to say to somebody, are you a lesbian? I am, and I'm married to your brother. You know what I mean? Um, I, that's not exactly the relationship, but but, but approximately, right? I, I I just think there's there's so much there's so much mileage to be gotten out of an anecdote like that. So, um, and I you know I mean I I find it entertaining. I I kind of I I'm, I guess that other you know other people will will find it entertaining as well as instructive, um, and and hope that they do. But at the same time, Melanie. You kind of deconstruct biography. I mean, the 
the project you're working on right now, 36 Views of René Vivian, um, almost says as much as we know or as much as we can try to counter entropy with our trouvailles, um, there's no way to really know a life, right? Or are we, you know, go back to that opposition between the imposition of identities on one hand and, um, and the seizing on to them. Mm -hmm. I mean, what does a biographer do? Uh, impose, impose something or relate the choices made? Um, and, you know, so these complications really come, come through uh, in your writing, I think. Well, Ju Julian Barnes says biography is tying holes together with string, which I think, you know, kind of that, that's kind of what it is. Right. You know, there's just but you find a whole bunch of holes and you work some string around them. And before you know it, you've kind of got something. I mean, it's a it's a sort of like, you know, it's sort of an intellectual macrame or something. I don't know what that makes it. But uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, you know, the, the project, the project of knowing a life is doomed because there's there really is no end to it and there's no such thing. Um, but I think the process of trying, the process of sort of trying out different stories and, you know, this person tells this story about that person. This person tells a different story about that person. They're both stories, but you can, you sort of can match them up. They're holes, you tie them up with string. Um, and from the interaction of the stories, something emerges. Like, neither, neither, you know, you don't say one story's true and one story's false. Both of these stories have a truth, but the truth is this person was telling the story to a third party, so they were more interested in emphasizing that, whereas this person, um, you know, was an ex-lover of the person, and so they have some animus or an axe to, you know, it's about contextualizing the stories, but when you put them all together, you sort of get something that emerges um, as a kind of coherence um, without, without uh, sacrificing the... Um, without sacrificing the individuality of the stories. Mm -hmm. um, and I think where, po where possible you preserve, you, pres you know, the anti-entropy is you preserve the stories, you, you preserve the records, you try to keep things, you try to keep things um, uh, in front of people so that they don't get lost again. I mean, every time I read, I read biographies and I realize how much information, how much basic information we've lost, especially, you know, women's lives, gay lives. I mean, lives that people didn't think were worthy of recording in the past. Uh, so much information is lost. And I just, I, I just love it when you get into an archive and you, you, you're like, oh, wow, you know, I didn't know that was that person. Oh my God, you know, um, it, it's, uh, 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 you know, it's just a wonderful, it's just a wonderful feeling. I'm sure other people, you know, this is, this is, this community here is, is, people are doing this stuff all the time so i'm sure there's other people out there who 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 have this you know this this is this is my drug of choice this is my thrill this is my uh <laughs> it's sad but true masha shall we shall we open up the discussion sure um i think there are a couple of questions in the chat oh yeah um, so okay. there's a question from um andrea goulet who is asking how have, have the, your biographical discoveries changed the way you read the prose and poetry of these writers? And then um, there are two people who raised their hands, so we can just afterwards can just go to them okay. live. Yeah. All right. Okay. Um, how? Yes. I mean, I, I have a tendency which is which is bad to read things autobiographically. And you know, in grad again, grad school, you know, you you taught never to do never conf never conflate the narrator and the author, right? I mean, that's just a, a cardinal sin. Um, and so I, you know, I try to keep that in mind. And 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 there's times when there's times when um, uh, you know it's important to keep to maintain that distinction. But I also even if even if the narrator is not the author. Um, the author created the narrator. So there is still, a, I would maintain, there is still a relationship between those two personae. Um, and of course, the author is a persona too. You know, you can't, it's like, you know, you never really know the author either. Um, but I do think it's interesting. I, I find it very interesting to reflect on those things. And I find it very interesting. Uh, you know, that does, that, that colors my reading of things. It shapes the reading um, of poetry and prose. You know, Renee Vivian is a very autobiographical poet, uh, and I think she meant to be. I mean, I do think I, I don't think that's that's um, 
I don't think that's a violation of, of, of her intentions. Um, I think a, a, she put a lot of herself, maybe not in everything, but a lot of herself into her writing. And so, um, you know, and the th I think the same with, you know, looking at art, looking at Romain Brooks. I mean, it's a very, it's a very personal oeuvre. It's a very personal work. Um, there's a lot of her in there. So, you know, yeah, is, yeah short answer, yes. <laughs> Um, let's see, were we going, were we going to the hands up or I, I forgot, was there other? Uh, so there is a Brian Martin and Charles Trival. Hi, Brian. Hi, Charles. Hey, hey. Thank you, Masha and Gretchen and Melanie for organizing this fabulous presentation. And Melanie, thank you uh, so much. I'm a, such a huge fan, Melanie. All of, you have so many fans here online today. How many of us have come to so many of your talks at NCFS? and read so many of your beautiful books in the past. I, I recently read your Finding the Woman Who Didn't Exist oh. in the Curious Life of Giselle Distock and um, just loved it. You were such a beautiful writer and you inspire the rest of us to do archival research that our work matters, that uncovering and talking about these lives that have been forgotten or haven't had that kind of voice matters. Um, I, I wanted to ask a question about sort of the, um, a, a broad uh, queer uh, historical um, landscape. And that is, I was fascinated in your presentation about the fact that Romaine Brooks and Natalie Barney both lived very long lives. They were 94, 96 each. Yep. Mm -hmm. And yep. that they die in 1970 and 72. So first was a personal question. I was born in 71. Is it possible that I'm the mystical queer reincarnated love child of Barney and, <laughs> and, and uh, Brooks? No, but more seriously, <laughs> they, they die in 70 and 72. So they yeah. die after Stonewall in 69. Yeah. Now, I don't know if these queer women knew about or were paying attention to trans women uh, in a secret gay bar in the village in New York, but the fact that they, their end point, their history becomes a beginning point, 69, 70, 70, 71, 72, for an explosion of queer uh, life and activism and rights, et cetera, up to our today. And I was just thinking too, that they had this long marriage you know, what would they think about queer marriage being so recent in the United States and in many countries? And yet they were on the verge of queer divorce too, even at the end saying, I've had it. Yep. And yep. queer divorce is the new queer marriage. You know, it's like <laughs> people have been married now for 10 years and are figuring out they're sick of each other. But the point is, uh, my question is, what about the broader landscape? Uh, what does it mean that they end their lives at this point of sort of a new American and global explosion of queer rights and discussion? Uh, where, what is their place in it? Perhaps. Yeah. I think I think by the by the end of their lives, you know, as you said, they're both in their 90s. They and they both have they both have aging issues. Um, you know, let's not forget Natalie Barney is evicted from her famous salon, the Rue Jacob, at the end of her life. She dies in the Hotel Maurice. She dies on the right bank. You know, everybody talks about her as a woman of the left bank. She dies on the right bank um, and she's evicted. So, you, I mean, you know, eviction for her is not what it would be for maybe you and me. You know, she's not out on the streets because her money um, shields her. Uh, but nevertheless, you know, people in their 90s, you know this, Brian, you know, that's not an easy time. And and having to change your life around, um, you know, that's not that's not what you're that's not what you and, um, you, you know, Romaine Brooks also had issues and she died in Nice. She's living in the South. So I don't think they are. I don't think they are as in touch with what's going on in, let's say, North America, as they would have been several decades ago in the 1930s, let's say, when there's a whole bunch of expatriate Americans who that, that they're socializing with um, as to their place. Uh, I think they 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 established their place in queer history. I think in in earlier decades, and I think primarily in the interwar years. Um, you know, that's when that's when Romaine Brooks is doing most of her work. Um, but they clearly did um, they clearly did um, mingle with a whole bunch of queer people in the broadest sense of the term, and. The role of Natalie Barney's salon was to was to provide a, a, a friendly space for that kind of for, the, for that kind of cultural exchange to happen. I mean, I think that's that's her great contribution. I mean, her writing is is I I I enjoy it. It's you know her aphorisms are um, um, it's not a genre that people like so much today. But I mean, her real contribution was this was the salon. So I think they 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 by then they were sort of like resting on their laurels a little bit. I think so. You know, there's 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 coincidence in the dates, but I, um, 
uh, you know, it's also it's also the emergence of the of the second wave of the women's movement. Then, you know, out of the '60s, and I think that it's interesting how that movement kept their and the memory of Rene, Rene Vivien. That's that's where their memory was kept alive for a long time. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the question, Charles. Yeah, um, I, uh, I love uh, Gretchen's uh, metaphor of, of going on a ride. Um, <laughs> And uh, I want to ask some specifics about the map um, that you know, the route you're taking. Um, I guess it's just two um, aspects of it, but I it, you've talked so much about um, uh, you know the, the laid out the book in a, in a marvelous fashion. One thing you failed to mention, but it it has to go uh, has to be said. The footnotes in this book are extraordinary. Um, it's just it, it it's it it beggars belief to use a word, uh, beggars belief that uh, you did this uh, archival research. As long as it doesn't and, bugger belief. No, not a buggering. There's beggaring. <laughs> um, I'm not sure we could go into that discussion, the beggar bugger. But anyhow, uh, because somewhere it's in a footnote here, apparently. Uh, but it really the so much of the research and, and the richness of the research uh, lies not just in the laying out uh, of of the main narrative, but also in the uh, um, apparatus that you provide. So I guess one that my question is, um, and it has to do also with the afterward, um, your uh, uh, editorial thinking, um, what to put, what to put where, so what to include in um, the, the body, as it were, of the uh, of the work, um, how to construct the inner chapter, why construct an inner chapter, um, an afterward. Um, what you're thinking about that was, and, and let me just mention that I, the, my two favorite footnotes um, are the one, the one about um, the, I mean the the find uh, on page uh, uh, footnote 33 on page 48, the one where you've, you you your your big discovery the uh, the Japan uh, story, and then the other one is it towards the end um, when you talk about. Um, uh, Who's who's whose song? God bless, God bless the USA. Um, Lee Greenwood, the Lee Greenwood footnote. I mean, th this is really a, a treasure trove um, on so many different levels. Uh, but I'd like to know about your just your thinking about constructing and putting putting these different all this richness together. It's a great question. Thank you, Charlie. The The short answer is that I myself have benefited from other people's footnotes. And so especially when I was working on the Rashield book, it's like, oh, my God, if people hadn't put things in footnotes, I, I would have had to reinvent the wheel. Um, so my, my sort of philosophy about footnotes is put everything in a footnote, because if it can help somebody else not have to reinvent the wheel, not have to go through that process again, if it can save them. Uh, you know, a, a, a big detour in that in that ride. Um, I think that's a useful thing. I love the notion that you can have favorite footnotes. I've never kind of like rated my books on the on 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 you know which my favorite footnotes, but that's definitely a category I have to start thinking about now. Um, I would I would probably stuff even more into the text if I could get away with it. Um, some editors want you to take stuff out even out of footnote you know the trend these days is away from footnotes and i find that i find that very sad i i love footnotes i always turn to the footnotes first and i i relish the footnotes that have great gossip and you know th th that contain gems of in of weird and wonderful information i just love that stuff and i so i i kind of assume my readers you know have some of that inclination as well um, but but as much as anything, you know, like stuff I try to find at the when you go to the BN, if you don't know the cut, if you don't know the number, you're screwed because there you might find a helpful librarian. But most of the time, if you go in with the cut and they try to say, oh, it's lost, it's missing, it's whatever you go. No, 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 no. Here's the cut. I have the cut. You know, I know the co the call number for this thing. Then, you you know, you, you have a chance of getting it. But if you don't even have the cut, if you don't have the call number, uh, it's much harder. So if I can help somebody else by telling them the call, here it is, here's the, call, here's the, here's the call number that you'll need if you want to go read this or check this or something. I, it, it's kind of like, um, it's a service. And um, I, I think editors who try to get you to leave that stuff out are not really doing, I know it makes a shorter manuscript and everybody wants books to be shorter. And yeah, yeah I get that. But um, 
you know, if if we're lucky, the books, if this is part of the anti-entropy. If we're lucky, the books will be around for a while and somebody else who comes along, you know, 20 years from now uh, will find that information and it will make their research. They can go a little bit further down the road because you've given them that, um, you've given them the head start. So if I answer your question, I'm not sure if I answered the question. Anyway, enjoy the ride. All right. Um, I think we have, oh, Nelly, Nelly. I think. Bonjour, Nelly. We can't hear you. Turn your mic on. <laughs> thank there you. Thank you. Uh, hello, Gretchen. Hello, Nelly. Nelly, I can you. see. Where are you? I'm, well, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for a wonderful presentation. Oh, there you are. <laughs> Um, Melanie, I have a question. Uh, are any of them, that is to say Vivian Brooks or Barney, involved with the feminist movements of the time? Yes, absolutely. Um, and, and, I'll, and I'll just give you one example. Um, René Vivien wrote uh, quite a lot for La Fronde, which, is the, which was the feminist newspaper that was founded by Marguerite Durand, um, for whom the library is named now. And um, uh, you know, it was a feminist newspaper roughly at the turn of the century, and it was written by women. It was important that it was written by women, produced by women, uh, printed by women, and written for women. Um, so she contributed quite a bit to, to that movement. Um, she died a little bit young, so you know, they, I mean, they weren't they weren't manif in the in the streets. Um, but I think, but you know, Natalie Barney was also, you know, uh, she also created an Académie des Femmes, for example, specifically to sort of counteract the misogyny of the Académie Française. Um, you know, trying to promote women's work, she founded a Prix, a Prix Littéraire in, in honor of René Vivien. So they weren't, they weren't necessarily, um, as I said, they weren't taking to the streets for these things. But I, I, they, they certainly, you know. Um, they, it's a big tent, and, and they were in the tent. Yep, participated. Well, thank you. Yep. Yes. Thank you. Thank you for the question. So, um, before 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 I, you know, before we end, I would like to also say thank you to our organizers. Thank you to Gretchen for being such a great interlocutrice, but also to the organizers, especially now that we've been able to meet in person at NCFS, and we hope to do so again in the future. Uh, I think the fact that we've continued this tradition of, you know, um, talks um, featuring and, and the ability to sort of come together and listen to people's work and stuff like this is, it's a great tribute to, um, I think, the uh, solidarity of our scholarly community. So thank you. Thank you to the organizers, both for initiating this, but also for continuing it and, and making it, you know, and making it such a great um, resource for us. Yeah. Ditto. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Melanie, for these kind words and for this wonderful, wonderful uh, conversation, which was very illuminating and uh, thought provoking and can't wait to read the book. So thank you very much. Uh, and um, uh, please feel free to um, turn on your cameras and stay for a few minutes. Have a a drink, a, a, a René Vivien cocktail, if you wish, <laughs> with us, and uh, just ask more questions. <laughs>